Um, also, we, we now know that there are modern um, methods or means to study things like iron buildup. And one of the things that Paolo Zamboni noticed, actually was in the literature back in the 1980s, is that there is an iron buildup in the veins of patients who have multiple sclerosis. And so he saw this problem. He was actually, his role was as a vascular surgeon looking at chronic venous disease in the peripheral vasculature. And so there he saw iron buildup also. And this was the beginning of his thought process that, that took him, because of his wife, to start thinking, could iron also play a role in the brain for multiple sclerosis patients? And what we have seen, it's actually been seen almost for 20 years in MR, that there is an iron buildup. But what I'm going to show you later today is that this iron buildup appears to be specifically associated with the venous pathway. And again, to corroborate or add information to what Dr. Palza said, it turns out that there's some work again in chronic venous disease in the peripheral vasculature that shows if you block the flow that there will be an, a response, an, an autoimmune response in the vessel wall associated with this change in flow. It might be obstructed flow. It might be reverse flow. And in this case, the blood vessel wall is not very happy. And you generate these T cells and B cells. And this has actually already been shown back in 2005 by John Bergen. And then in 2009, Paolo Zamboni came along and introduced to the world back in September of last year through his workshop in Italy that they had this first evidence that multiple sclerosis may be more strongly related to the veins uh, as a, a possible source, although I do want to qualify that. No one's saying we know this is the source yet, but it just turns out that people with multiple sclerosis also tend to have a lot of these venous problems. So I wanted to give you a quote from this early work of Tracy Putnam because I think he was, uh, at least he was one of the early believers, and, and let me read this to you, the last sentence of his 1935 paper. The similarity between such lesions and many of those seen in cases of multiple sclerosis in man is so striking that the conclusion appears almost inevitable that venous obstruction is the essential immediate antecedent to the formation of typical sclerotic plaques. And the reason he says this, because of the 14 dogs he studied, they all developed plaques that were similar to multiple sclerosis. Again, we don't have the, the access to that today to validate that they were identical but they certainly were similar. He remained a believer of this theory for the rest of his life. So chronic cerebral spinal venous insufficiency, as Paolo Zamboni calls it, is related to narrowing of the veins, but not always just to a stenotic vein. It's related really to abnormal flow. And some of the examples I'll show you today demonstrate there's not just one simple source. It's not like having the flu and there's a particular virus that causes that. There may be 10 different reasons why there is some abnormality in the venous flow for multiple sclerosis patients. Again, we're not saying that this is the source. We're just pointing out that this is the characterization that we've seen with both MRI and with ultrasound. So I'd like to show you an example first of a technique that we developed about 10 years ago. It's called susceptibility weighted imaging. It's a technique that we use to look at the veins in the brain and uh, the image in the right-hand side here is from a cadaver brain where a dye was injected and we take these wonderful images of veins that are anywhere from 200 microns to a millimeter or so in diameter. And this is a volunteer and you can see that we have great similarities between these two. Now, now I would like to tell you we don't sacrifice our volunteers to demonstrate that this is true. <laughs> so my students are happy that they remain and they can become PhDs. Um, and besides, today, we're not allowed to image our own students anyways. Um, so you can see the similarities are quite clear. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence there. So I want to use that information to show you that, in fact, we can not only see the iron deposition now associated with these veins, but we can see that it actually follows in an anti-grade pattern the, the pathway of the veins themselves. So, so here's this cadaver brain case. And then here's a normal person, similar to what I showed you a minute ago, and you don't see any of these dark areas that you see in the left-hand side. And for those of you who know your anatomy, this is the caudate nucleus, and you can see the iron buildup here just at the drainage of the vein. So if we look at all these veins coming out of the caudate nucleus, coming down into a main vein, draining vein, this is where they all come together. 
and this is where we have the highest iron deposition. If we follow that over time, that iron deposition gets worse and continues to work its way backwards, anti-grade to the flow. You can see this not only in the caudate, but you can see it in the globus pallidus, you can see it in the putamen. So this is a pretty strong marker that there's not just iron buildup, but there's iron associated with these structures in multiple sclerosis. Now, this kind of uh, koala bear-like picture is actually a slice through the midbrain of the brain, and it shows a number of different structures, uh, which are called red nucleus, substantia nigra. But this is a 32-year-old normal person, and this is a 32-year-old MS person. And you can see, that, so we've age-matched these to make sure we can draw the correct conclusion, because one of the problems is, as we all get older, the iron increase in our brain, in, in, con, the iron continues to increase in our brain, and as Burton Dreyer of New York says, we all rust as we get old. So we have to make sure that, that you know, this guy hasn't rusted, and, and, and so he looks the same as an MS case. So you can see the MS person has much more iron in, in the brain. Um, and this is just one last image here. This is an area called the pulvinar thalamus, which we find in young people becomes a very strong marker of people who have multiple sclerosis. And so some of these are new markers compared to what we've been used to looking for in, in MRI in the past and are further indicators that there's a problem. So what Paolo Zamboni did is he put all of this together and he said, okay, Bergen has said bad flow means T cells, B cells, and some problem on the endothelium that leads to iron buildup. And he said, there must be something wrong somewhere else. And so he literally looked outside the box, the box being our brain in this case, and he said there must be something wrong in the vessels that are draining the blood from the brain. And so you can see from this example that in this particular individual, the jugular vein, so remember the jugular veins coming down like this and taking the blood back to the heart, becomes extremely narrow. So we say it's a stenotic vessel. And so this is one of the patterns that he recognized. And so what he did was to go in, with the catheter, and he put uh, a balloon in here, and he did balloon angioplasty, so he opened that back up so the blood could flow back out properly. And, and this is the type of thing that he did on those 65 cases. What we want to do in, in part of our MRI study is we want to use the ultrasound like Zamboni did, but MR offers much more than ultrasound. It gives us the ability to look at the entire uh, brain, the neck, even the, the aortic arch in three dimensions, and create wonderful 3D movies for the radiologist and neurologist to look at this data and see, is there anything wrong? But more than that, it lets us also quantify the blood flow and see if the blood is flowing properly or not as a function of the cardiac cycle. Now, ultrasound can also do that, but not to the same degree and not with the same ease of access from the brain to above the heart that MR can do. And finally, we're also using SWI to look at the, the general small venous structures and the iron content in the brain. So that's part of our protocol. So this is an example here, um, a case that was sent to me from Germany. It's quite different from, from what I showed you from Paolo Zamboni. In this particular case, this is called an ectatic carotid artery. So the, the carotid artery bifurcates into two parts, an internal and an external. But in this particular case, what happens is the internal goes almost 90 degrees like this and, and almost crushes the, the jugular. In fact, this isn't seen in just one case. I think people who are doing this around the world will tell you they've seen that in other cases also. And on the right-hand side, you can see a normal jugular. So not all people have such nice normals, but this is a good example of a normal straight jugular that is not stenotic. Now, here's another case where this particular person, and this person is from Canada, I'm happy to say. It happens to have been imaged in the United States, but is from Canada. And uh, you can see this person has bilateral stenosis. Now, these stenosis don't always appear in the same location. In some people, it might appear up here, in other people in the middle, in other people in this location. So there's a whole range of these problems. It's not like if someone has a stenosis, it's always in the same place for the same reason. We don't even know the source of these stenosis. Sometimes it might be that there's a blocked valve associated with that draining vein. In other cases, it might be a real stenosis. So I just wanted to show you an example here of the 3D rotating image. This really gives the physician an opportunity to look at this structure in three dimensions and find out where are the abnormalities associated with these vessels. 